Hello there and welcome to another edition of Crimeline. We hope, as usual, that you can help us with tonight's cases. We're grateful for your help last month as a result of your calls. Two people have been provisionally identified from the security videos. The Guardi hope that viewers watching tonight may be able to help them with their investigation into the murder of John Cusack, a 57-year-old farmer from Limerick. Mr Cusack's body was found outside his farmhouse in Mean Tulla, Maru in County Limerick sometime between the hours of 8.30pm on Saturday the 23rd of September and 2pm on Monday the 25th of September last. He died from gunshot wounds to his head and back. His body was found by the local postman who discovered the corpse lying face down outside the front of the house when he went to deliver letters. The Guardi have pieced together his last known movements before his murder in the following reconstruction. Somebody out there tonight may have vital information to solve this murder investigation. John Cusack's remote farm is situated in Mean Tulla, Maru in County Limerick. It's a lonely rural part of the countryside, although it lies only 13 miles from Limerick City. John Cusack lived there on his own, where he looked after his farm holding. John Cusack and his family were well known in the community of Mean Tulla to neighbours, farmers and cattle dealers. Mr Cusack was 57 years of age. He was a strongly built man who was known to be a very hard worker. He was married with seven children, four sons and three daughters who were all grown up. On the morning of Saturday the 23rd of September, John Cusack left his home and headed off shopping in Limerick. He was seen by the local garage man in Maru at around 10 o'clock, driving his yellow Toyota Hilux with registration number 85TS245, going in the direction of the five cross roads on the way to Limerick. He called to his son's shop at 1 Upper Pennywell Road sometime before 11 o'clock, wearing his usual working clothes. He seemed to be in good form. Jack. Grand day, thank God. Grand. There's a few tomatoes there. A few tomatoes, right? I think they're off the right. About five or six, is it? Yeah. And the paper? Take the paper, right? Okay, it's uh, 120. He headed back home and got a phone call at 12.30 from his daughter Breda in Limerick, who wanted a lift out of town. Hello? Hi Dad, it's me. Breda, how are you? Um, could you give me a lift out with you? Alright, pick you up around 2 o'clock. Yeah, that's grand. I I'll see you then, okay? Bye bye. Hello? you right there, Breda. He picked his daughter up at two o'clock at Cherrydale Court on the Dublin Road in Limerick. The two of them drove home. Uh, well, my dad picked me up about half two outside my mum's flat. Um, we drove out to Maru, where he lives, and I met him a cup of tea. And he said to, to, he'd go lie down for half an hour because he was tired and to call him up in about half an hour. So I did and met him at yet another cup of tea. And he went out doing some farm work. For a couple of hours I just went for a walk around the farm and did some housework, tied it up for him and then around six o'clock he came back in again and said to make some supper and then we'd go back into town because I was going out that night with my sister and um, so I made him supper at about half seven then we, we decided we'd head back into town so we left about eight, got back into town at half eight and he dropped me off beside Frank Hogan's and told him I'd give him a ring during the week. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Are you going up for a drink? No, I won't bother. I'll wait a while. Okay, okay. I'll see you. See you again. Thanks. Hello. Bye. Bye. What happened to John Cusack after that remains something of a mystery. He may have been meeting someone on that Saturday evening or had a visitor to the house on Sunday morning. The Gardaí were alerted to the murder by a postman who called to the house at Mean Tulla. The house was locked and the key was missing from the door. 
He found the body of John Cusack lying face down with a wound to the back of his head. Jesus, John. John Cusack's dog was inside the house. Tango Charlie calling Tango 83. We have a report of a suspicious death at Cusack's Mean Tulla Maru. Can you go there immediately and investigate? Over. Mission received. We will go there immediately. Over. along here and uh, at the delivery of the post and suddenly I saw... What was unusual uh, was the fact that he was wearing a good suit and had recently shaved, which was peculiar for a man who rarely got out of his well-worn working clothes. Right. How long he's there, I just don't know. Superintendent's office, bro. Hello, Superintendent O'Keefe. That's right. This is the pathologist here from the regional hospital. Oh, yes, you have something for me, Doctor. Yes, we've just completed the post-mortem on your murder victim, John Cusack, and I can give you the results now of our findings. Right. Go ahead. The victim died as a result of two gunshot wounds, one to the back of his head and the other to his lower back. Either wound would have killed him. Two gunshot wounds, one to the lower back and the other to the back of his head. It right. was a double-barrel shotgun and a 12-gauge cartridge was used. Will you send me your report as soon as possible, Doctor? Yes, I'll send you the results this evening. Thank you very much indeed. So what happened to John Cusack? Maybe somebody watching tonight spotted him between the time he parted company with his daughter on Saturday at half past eight and the time his body was found on Monday the 25th at two o'clock. Any information you may have could be crucial. Superintendent Michael O'Keefe is the officer leading the investigation. Uh, Michael, why would anybody want to kill uh, John Cusack? Well, David, at this stage of the investigation, we are still searching for that answer. But a lot of ground has been covered in this investigation, and I would like to thank the people of Maru and the people of the wider Limerick region for their great cooperation to us. Well, the main thrust of your investigation obviously hinges around what happened uh, to John Cusack after he left his daughter. Well, he left his daughter at 8.30 p.m. on Saturday the 23rd. Now, at that time, he was wearing his old farm clothes, farm boots, and was unshaven. That, that was the last time he was seen alive. Now, when his body was found on Monday by the postman, he was wearing his new clothes, good shoes, and had been shaven. So you're making an assumption, obviously, that he'd made some sort of arrangement. Yes. Well, we'd like to appeal to anybody who met him after he dropped off his daughter in Limerick, after he parted with his daughter. Did he meet somebody on the way home? Was there somebody waiting for him when he arrived home? Or had he a prior arrangement to go out later that night? Right, so a prior arrangement in the district or perhaps even in Limerick? Yes. Um, what about the, the murder weapon? You're, you're also interested in that. Uh, the murder weapon is a double barrel shotgun uh, using a 12 gauge cartridge. Now, David, this is a, tom uh, a common a type of weapon uh, used to shoot game or deer. But uh, John Cusack didn't have a gun of his own? No, John Cusack did not have any gun of his own. Um, this is significant though, the, the change of clothing. The change he, of clothing. He, he didn't normally uh, wear such attire, you're saying? Yes, yeah. uh, it was unusual for John Cusack uh, to change to go out to socialise or to go for a drink. He would do so in his old clothes, his old farm clothes. Are you appealing to, uh, to anybody else, just people who may know something in the district? That's right. Anybody who met or spoke or who had a prior arrangement to meet John Cusick after 8.30 p.m. on Saturday night, the 23rd of September. All right. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Indeed, uh, if you have any further information on that particular case, that is uh, the murder of John Cusack. It happened sometime between the 23rd and the 25th of September uh, near Maru in County Limerick. Call us now at 1-850-4050-60.
Well, now on the crime desk with a security video on details of stolen property. Here's Siobhan Redpath and Jerry Lynch. We begin tonight with a robbery on a jewellery shop in Bray County, Wicklow. The incident occurred on Monday the 6th of November at approximately a quarter to six in the evening. Four raiders enter the premises of Bannon's Jewellers on Castle Street, where one of the raiders threatened staff with what appeared to be a handgun. Five trays of gold bangles and some cash were taken and the raiders escaped in the direction of Ravenswell Road and Bray Golf Club. The first culprit is described as being in his mid-twenties, about six foot one, clean shaven and well built. He wore a black leather jacket and had black hair parted in the middle and gelled. He spoke with a Dublin accent. The second raider was aged approximately 45, six foot with blonde hair going grey. He wore a red wine jacket with a zip. The other two raiders were aged 22 or 23. Both were about 5 foot 10 with Dublin accents. If you think you can identify the gang or have been offered what you think is stolen jewellery recently or know anything about this incident, give us a call. Now to two serious assaults in Dublin, which the Gardaí think might be connected. The first incident happened at a quarter past three in the morning on St Stephen's Green on the 14th of September. As the victim was walking past the Unitarian Church, she became aware of a man following her. He came up behind her and grabbed her arm. She struggled with him, and as she did so, a taxi driver came to her assistance. He ran off towards Cuff Street, which in intersects with Harcourt Street. The second incident occurred on the 20th of October at Diggs Lane in Dublin, at 5 to 3 in the morning. The victim was standing a few yards from the doorway entrance to a club on Diggs Lane when she was grabbed by the arm by a man who dragged her 20 yards down the lane. He then hit her on the face and raped her. He then left the scene heading in the direction of Bow Lane East. The descriptions of the culprits in both incidents are very similar. The attacker is described as being approximately 30 years old and about 5 feet 9. He is of medium build with black hair brushed back in a tidy cut and thinning on top. He was wearing a white shirt with a grandfather collar and blue jeans. The victim in the Diggs Lane incident has described this photo fit as being very like the attacker, in particular the eyes and hair. So we are hoping someone will be able to identify him. On the 31st of October at St John's Road outside Houston Station, a man got out of a stolen blue Mazda 626 and grabbed a handbag. The victim was injured in the struggle. The culprit then got back into the car and drove off. The car registration 89D 13794 was subsequently found abandoned at Sean Tracy House Flats in the north inner city area. The man is described as aged between 16 and 18, tall with a slim build and short dark hair. If you think you know who he, who he is, we'd like to hear from you. We're hoping someone tonight may be able to let us know the whereabouts of this man. Michael Clark, a native of Belfast, has been missing from his home in Bishopstown, County Cork, since the 31st of March. He's 21, 6 feet 1, with a strong build. He has brown hair, a sallow complexion, and a slight turn in his right eye. Garthi are trying to trace some valuable antique items stolen in a number of incidents recently. This Chester silver clock was stolen from a house in Waterford City earlier this year. It's nine and a half inches tall in a shaped case on four bracket feet. This 18th century bureau valued at £40,000 was stolen from a house in County Westmeath in June. It was specially handcrafted for the ancestors of the Royal Castle in Dresden, Germany and is only one of its kind in existence. And this antique table was taken from a house in Ornmore, County Galway in June. It is of standard height with a marble top of about three feet in diameter and the top is laid with marble pieces in different colours. It is valued at between 15 and 20,000 pounds. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of these valuable pieces, get in touch with us here at Crimeline. Or you may be able to help us to locate these next two items. This baler was taken from land in the horse and jockey area of Tipperary in May. It's a round baler of class make green in colour. Its type class is 46. And this lawnmower was stolen from a garden shed in Old Town County Dublin in March. It's a 12 horsepower ride-on lawn flight and it's valued at £2,000. 
Gardi at Garristown think it would have taken at least two people to lift it onto a vehicle to transport it away. If you've been offered either of these two machines, or you know where they might be now, contact us here. Now some video footage which you might be able to help us with. This incident occurred at the Hillside Service Station in, Enne in Enniscarry, County Wicklow, on the 14th of October. Two men, one of whom was carrying a hammer, entered the shop and knocked the attendant to the ground. One of the raiders went behind the counter and took money from the till and some cigarettes from the shelf. He then left the scene in the direction of Ballyman Road. The first raider was about 5 foot 8 of average build. He wore a black baseball cap, a blue tracksuit top and black Nike Air Max runners with a green stripe. He may have had a slight moustache. His face was not covered although he held his hand over it during the robbery. The second raider wore a blue tracksuit top similar to that worn by his accomplice. He also wore green jeans and runners. Finally to some property which is in the possession of the Gardaí at Dunleary, which we're hoping to reunite with its owner or owners. This lady's nine carat diamond cluster ring with diamond insets on either side and this nine carat diamond gold wedding band. That's all from Crime Desk for this month and a reminder that details of all the property featured on the Crime Desk are on Airtel, RTE, Network 2, page 520. On Tuesday, the 24th of August, armed raiders held up two security men making a cash collection at Dunn stores on the Church Road and got away with a large amount of money. In this reconstruction of that raid, we have descriptions of the raiders and of some of their backup team and getaway cars. We hope that you can provide us with identifications or information that will lead to the capture of this gang. The security van arrived at Dunn stores at 11.45 on a routine collection. There were two men on board, the driver and a man who would enter the premises to take out the money. The established procedure was that the collector would be dropped off at the front of the premises and make his way to the offices where he would pick up the money. The driver would take the security van around to the rear of the premises and park the van close to the exit door to reduce the exposure of his colleague carrying the money. The raiders were obviously familiar with the routine and on this occasion had placed some pallets in a position between the exit door and the van where one of them could lie in wait for the security man to emerge with the money. When the security man and a Dunn Stores employee opened the exit door, the raider attacked. Get out! Get out! Jesus! Take it easy! Get out! The raider grabbed the money and ran around the security van to the getaway car, a white Volvo which had just been driven in from the front of the car park. The raiders drove out onto the church road and then onto the Geeshill Road, which goes in the direction of Geeshill and Port Arlington. About four miles outside Tullamore, the raiders drove into Killery Lane. They drove along Killery Lane to this spot, where they abandoned the car. It's a turn left off Killery Lane, down a narrow track. It's presumed they were met here by another car. A white Fiat Mirafiori was seen in the area about this time, and the Gardaí think it may be the getaway car. It's believed the raiders hid the money in the Killery Lane area, somewhere close to this farmyard. The money was recovered by the gang two nights later, on Thursday the 26th of August. Two men in a blue Ford Fiesta van with a 90WX, Wexford registration, were seen in Killery Lane. Later that night, a large white van described as either a Mercedes or Fiat Ducato was seen here at the Curra Geesh Hill. With it was the blue Fiesta van with a 90WX, Wexford registration. The Volvo 440 used in the raid was stolen at Black Rock in Dublin on Saturday the 21st of August. It was parked in Dublin Airport, where it remained until early on the morning of the 24th, the day of the raid. On the morning of the raid, shortly before the arrival of the security van at Dunn Stores, the driver of the Volvo met up with a couple in an old Toyota Corolla, parked here in the car park in front of Dunn's. The Volvo, with driver only, reversed up to the boot of the Corolla. 
both boots were opened and something was transferred from one boot to the other. The Corolla is described as old and battered. There were the letters ZE in the registration and the number three. The three was hanging on the registration plate and looked like an E. The woman passenger got out of the Corolla and headed in the direction of the entrance to the store. The Volvo was then driven out of the car park, onto the church road, and then back into the car park again. Right, well, there you get an idea of what happened in Tullamore. Uh, Jerry Murray, this seems to have been a very well-planned um, raid. Yes, we believe it was very, very well-planned and very well-executed. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, we feel that uh, those criminals were probably in that area and had it cased out in the days and weeks before the crime was committed. So, in other words, if anybody saw people be or can recollect seeing people behaving uh, in any way suspiciously long before it happened, or a week or two before it happened. That's right. We'd be very interested in hearing from those. Now, when they abandoned the Volvo at Killery Lane, how did they get away from there? Well, we believe that they got away from that scene in a white Mirafiori, or a Fiat 131 car, which was seen in that area on the Sunday and Monday, the two days prior to the, the crime. And indeed was also seen going out Killery Lane uh, at about half past 12 on that date, on the day of the crime. Right. That would be after the crime was committed. So again, is there a space in there where people could help you? Yes, we would like to talk to anybody who saw persons abandoning the white Volvo car at that point in the Killery Lane and getting into another vehicle that we took them away from there. Right. Okay, now, w they didn't, when they left, they left the money behind them? Well, we believe that they hid the money in the Killery Lane area about a half a mile from where the white, where the white Volvo was abandoned. Mm -hmm and came back subsequently, some two nights later, to recover it. That's what we believe happened. Right, and do you know uh, how they did, or what cars or vans or trucks they used? Yes, uh, there was a blue Fiesta van observed travelling into the Killery Lane about 10.30pm on the following Thursday night, that would be two nights later, the 26th of August. A few minutes later it was observed facing the opposite direction, but parked at an old disused farm yard that was shown on the, on the footage there. Yeah. And um, it was then empty, so we believe that the occupants, there were two persons travelling in the van we believe at that time, that the occupants had got into the old farm yard and were recovering the money at that time. When it was sighted? When it was sighted. Right. Yes. So, d and then do you know that they definitely got something and came back and, and disappeared in well, that? Well, this uh, blue Fiesta van was seen a few minutes later at the Cora Gishel, which is uh, about a half a mile on the Tullamore side of the village of Gishel. It was seen there, the, the two vehicles were seen there, this uh, white, or this blue Fiesta van and a white Mercedes van, or it may be a Fiat Decato van, it's one of those large white vans. They mm -hmm. were seen parked engine to engine, and uh, they were the, it was there for about, certainly for half an hour. And the uh, stolen checks and the wallets in which the money was contained, which was stolen from Dunn stores, was found in the field the following morning at that point. Right. So, so obviously they sorted out the money from the, the documents, from the checks and the other documents that were taken from Dunn stores. Right. Now, Going through those, in what kinds of special areas can, can the viewers help you? Well, there's a number of areas where the viewers can help us, we feel. First of all, there was a bearded man who was driving a white or silver coloured uh, Land Rover, parked very convenient to where the crime was committed, at the rear of Dunn stores, and he saw the crime being committed. And we haven't met, we haven't uh, interviewed him, he didn't come forward, and we'd appeal to him to come forward. And uh, give us whatever assistance he can. Right, okay, anything else? Uh, there was any other motorist who might have been parked there on that day, that was a Tuesday, there'd be a good few shoppers there and uh, we'd be anxious to speak to any motorist who might have seen anything unusual there at that particular time. Yeah. To any persons who might have seen the occupants of the white Volvo changing cars in the Killery Lane and travelling out again, we believe they travelled out of Killery Lane again in the white 
uh, Fiat 131 or Merifiori. Yeah. Yes. Or anybody who saw the blue Fiesta van and the white Mercedes van at the Cora Gishel about between 10.30 and 11.30 p.m. on the following Thursday night, the 26th of August. We'd like to speak to all of them. Right, so in any of those areas, if they could give you information on that? Absolutely. We'd be very pleased to right. speak Right, okay. Them. Well, hopefully they will, Jerry. And uh, any assistance that you can give on that will be uh, very welcome indeed. The number, as always, is one 850 40, 50, 60. Well, that's all we have for you on Crime Line for the moment. Thank you for all your calls and do keep them coming. As I say, we'll be on the air on, or with the, the phones will be open until midnight and we really do appreciate your help. We'll be back, of course, with an update just after questions and answers. Talk to you then.